We've been discussing the chain rule and how we use that in order to find derivatives of implicit functions. Today we're going to talk about using the chain rule to find derivatives of parametric functions. And what a parametric function is, is it's when instead of defining y in terms of x, so you just have the two variables that one is defined in terms of the other, you have both the x and y coordinates defined in terms of another variable. Usually we use t for time. So the thing that we can get out of this that we don't necessarily get with x and y is that we can trace a path or a position of a particle as it moves along a path in terms of time. So in this case, if we have the circle with a radius of 1, and we want to define this using a time variable so that we want to go around the circle. Well, that would depend on where you want to start and which way you want to go around the circle. Since we look at this and it reminds us of what we did when we learned about radian angle measures and going around the circle to find how many, uh, not degrees, but radians of rotation there were, it might be a good idea to think of terms of this. So if we start right here, the x and y, if this is a unit circle, the x and y coordinates of this point are 1, 0. And let's say we want to move counterclockwise. Well, as the point moves along the circle in the counterclockwise direction, Notice that its x-coordinate is decreasing, but its y-coordinate is increasing until it gets here. And that point would be 0 for x and 1 for y. And then as we continue to move counterclockwise, the x-coordinate continues to decrease into the negative range, and the y-coordinate decreases until it gets to this point, which is negative 1, 0. And then it continues again around in the counterclockwise direction until it gets down here where it is 0, negative 1. And then it completes its cycle, returning back to 1, 0. Now, there's a hint in the fact that I talked about the radian angle measure. And we learned about that when we talked about trigonometric functions. So we want to have two separate functions, one for x and one for y. If we're starting here at time zero, x has to start at one. And then as the time changes, let's say that this is when the time is pi over two. The x coordinate has gone down to zero. And then it continues when it's at this point, let's say the time is pi. I hope you can see where I'm going with this. Now the x-coordinate is negative 1. So if we think about our trigonometric functions, when our angle, which our time is basically representing here, is 0, we get a value of 1 for the sine. So if the x-coordinate is the sine of t, starting here, it starts, sorry, I m misspoke, I mean the cosine. <laughs> it starts at 1. As the time increases to pi over 2, the cosine is 0. Then as the time increases to pi, the time becomes negative, or sorry, the cosine becomes negative 1. And then at, neg at 3 pi over 2, it becomes 0 again, and it goes back to 2 pi, it becomes 1 again. The y-coordinate starts at 0 and then increases and then decreases and then increases again. So the y-coordinate would be sine of t. So if you think about going around the circle once, the time would start at 0. And if we're only going to go around the circle once, it would end at 2 pi. If we extended the time past 2 pi, 
it would continue tracing around the circle more than once. Now, you might want to think about how would this change if I wanted to go around the circle clockwise? Or how would it change if instead of starting at this point, I wanted to start at this point with t equals zero? I welcome you to think about that and come up with some ideas to discuss in class on uh, Thursday. Now here we have a definition of a parametric function in a slightly different form. Instead of giving you a written function for the two different coordinates, I'm giving you a graph that describes those two functions. So our two functions, instead of being x and y, are f and g. Okay. Notice up here it says x is f of t and y is g of t. Notice that when you have a linear section of the function, that means the coordinate is changing in a steady manner because Remember, linear functions have a constant slope, so that it's changing in a constant way. So with this function, for f, when t is 0, f is 0. So I'm going to make myself a little chart, just like I do when I'm graphing. But instead of just having x and y, I'm also going to have t in my chart. Now notice our t's go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and in the, each section in between it's linear. So those are probably four important points to look at, or sorry, five important points to look at, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the x-coordinate is the f function. So when t is 0, this is going to be t, and this is going to be f of t, which is x. And the same thing down here, this is going to be t, and this is going to be g of t, which is y. So for the x-coordinate, when t is 0, the x-coordinate is 0. When t is 1, the x-coordinate is 2. When t is 3, the x-coordinate is 0. And when t is 4, the x-coordinate... Did I mess up? Oh, 2 was still 2. Sorry, I messed that up. 3 is 0, and 4 is 0. Now for the y-coordinate, we go down to the g-function. When t is 0, g is 0. When t is 1, g is still 0. When t is 2, g is 1. When t is 3, g is still 1. And when t is 4, g is back to 0. So now I'm going to try to plot the coordinates x and y as the time moves from 0 through 4. Now, all these numbers are positive, and so it's changing in a, since it's changing in a constant way, I don't really need negative parts of my graph here. And this time my coordinates are going to be x and y, because this is the, the coordinates of my point that is moving using the parameter t from here. So my x-coordinate started at 0 and my y-coordinate is 0. So 0, 0 is the location of the point at t equals 0. When t is 1, I'm at the point 2, 0. When t is 2, I'm at the point 2, 1. When t is 3, I'm at the point 0, 1. And when t is 4, I'm back to 0, 0. Now, looking at my x-coordinate, notice that the value of my x-coordinate increased steadily up to 2 when time was 1 but my y-coordinate stayed constant. That means my y-value was 0 all the way through this x-movement from 0 to 1, and it moved steadily. 
So my point started here and it moved to the right to this point at time equals 1. Then between 1 and 2, my x coordinate did not change. It stayed 2, which means I'm going to be traveling on the vertical line where x is 2. But my y coordinate increased from 0 to 1. So we're moving straight up between time 1 and 2. Between time 2 and 3, our x coordinate steadily decreases from 2 down to 0, while our y coordinate remained constant. So that means since our y is constant, we're moving on a horizontal line, and x was decreasing, so we're moving to the left until we got to x is 0. And then for the last bit of time there between 3 and 4, our x coordinate remains constant and our y coordinate decreases. So since our x is constant, we're moving on the vertical line and our y is going downhill. So if you want to describe this motion in words, I would say the point starts at the coordinate 0, 0. Between the first, between the 0 and the first second, it moves to the right in a constant speed until it reaches the point 2, 0. Then it moves up from the point 2, 0 to the point 2, 2, two 1, rather, between the, second, from between the first and the second second. Then it moves to the left at a constant rate of speed between the second and third second until it reaches the point 0, 1, and then it moves down taking one second to move from the point 0, 1 to 0, 0. Or you would say it traces a path clockwise, sorry, counterclockwise around a rectangle with a width of 2 and a height of 1, starting at the lower left-hand corner, and it takes exactly one second to trace along each side at a constant rate of seat, seat, sorry, speed for each side. Now, if you were watching this happen, since it takes the same amount of time to move two spaces here as it takes to move one space here, it would appear to move faster, which could, because it would be moving faster, as it moved the horizontal longer distance than it does when it moves the vertical distance because it's moving farther in the same length of time that it's moving the other distance. Now, if I go down to this problem here, and it says describe the motion of a particle with the given parametric equation. x is sine of 2t, and y is cosine of 2t. It's often helpful to make yourself a chart like this using values for t and then plugging them in to see what you get for x and y. When you see trigonometric functions, it's a good idea to use values for t that are going to give you nice round angles that are going to give you nice exact answers to make it easier to do. And I'll leave it to you to try to do that by hand. But I want to show you that you can actually see this on the calculator using a different setting than you're used to using. So first, let's just let me find my program here. I'm going to adjust my focus a little, hopefully, so it's clearer. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to go into my y equals and clear out what's there. Now, because we're using parametric equations, the first thing we have to do is go to mode. And I'm going to move this up a little so you can see some of the buttons at least. Notice right here in the fourth lane line, we have function, which is what we normally deal with. And then we have parametric. So you're used to seeing what the Y list looks like when you have it on function. So I'm going to set it on parametric by using the arrows to move down there and hitting enter. 
And now, if I go to the y equals list, notice that instead of having y1 equals, y2 equals, and so on, for each different color for the graph, we have an x1 of t and a y1 of t. So that our two coordinates, x and y, are going to be defined in terms of a third variable, t. So in the problem we were just looking at, it said sine of 2t. And notice when I hit the xt theta n button, it now uses t instead of x. And then I hit enter, and my y1 was cosine of 2t. Now before I go to look at the graph for this, I want to point something out. Over here to the left, this is the default. It's just a solid straight line. That will draw just a solid line, not necessarily straight, as it traces the path of the points. This one I have set on something different. Let me show you how you can change that. If I go to the left, oh, there we are. So that that is now highlighted and I hit enter. I can choose the color if you have a color calculator. I can also choose the type of line. And let me just show you what's available there. This version traces a solid line, but it also has a moving dot that shows where it is at any point in time. That's the one we're going to want to use. This one just shows where it is at a point in time and doesn't show the path that it followed. This gives us a dotted line. That gives us a dotted line with smaller dots. And that's the solid line. That's a thicker solid line. So I'm going to go back to the one that traces the path but also shows you the point as it's moving. And now, sine and cosine. I'm going to think about this a little bit before I set my graph settings. The y values, the function values of sine and cosine are always between negative 1 and 1. So even though I've got 2t in there, the values of x and y are always going to be between negative 1 and 1. So when I set up my graph for this, I want my x range to be between negative 1 and 1, and I want my y range to be between negative 1 and 1 at least. I can go further than that. And I might want to change it so that it looks like it's in proportion, you know, square, because our graphs comes out rectangular even if we put the same dimensions on it. The 2t is going to affect what we're plugging into that. And if we think about the things we plug into sine and cosine in order to get all the possible values, I want my t to be able to go make my angle so that they at least include from 0 to 2 pi, possibly further. So since this is 2t, I would want my t values to go f at least from 0 to pi. So if I go to Window to change my settings, notice now instead of just x min and x max and x step and y min and y max and y step, we also have the t values. So I want my t minimum, I'm going to just start out with 0 and pi. And you want to leave your t-step relatively small because it's going to be, the, the path is going to be pretty jagged if you make it too big. Um, I'm going to leave it on the default setting there for now. And my x's, I'm going to go from negative 1 to 1 by 1's. And my y's, I'm going to go from negative 1 to 1 by 1's. And now I'm going to graph and watch what happens. You can barely see it. Oh, something strange happened. All right, what did I type wrong? It seems like I typed on something incorrectly here. I bet I know what's wrong. I bet I'm in degrees instead of radians, and yes, I am. So, yeah, we want to make sure we're set in radians before we do this. Sorry about that. So here we go. So that moved pretty quickly. It started at the top of the circle and whipped around once. Now, if I make my t-step smaller, it's going to move more slowly because it's going to change the t-value at a different rate. 
So if I make my t value, let's say, instead of 0.13, let's make it 0 0.05. Let's go and see why it didn't like that. 0 0.05. OK, that worked. Now I'm going to graph it again. And notice it didn't move quite as quickly this time, but it still went in a clockwise direction starting at the top once around the circle. Now I'm going to go back to my window. And I'm going to change my t maximum to 2 pi. So before we look at this, think for a minute, what do you think is going to happen to the way it graphs? So when I hit enter and graph, well, it looks like it's doing the same thing it did before. But notice now it's going around the circle again because the angle didn't just go from 2 times 0 to 2 times pi. It went from 2 times 0 to 2 times 2 pi. So it went around the circle twice. So if I were going to describe, as it said here, the motion of the particle with that parametric equation, I would say that it traces the path of a unit circle centered at the origin from the top at 0, 1 clockwise around the circle. Since this didn't specify any certain range for t, I can't really say how many times around the circle that it went. So I'm going to write that out. Traces a unit circle starting at 0, 1 clockwise. Now, if we think about objects that are just moving in a straight line, if they're moving in a straight line with a constant velocity, then that means x is changing at a constant rate and y is changing at a constant rate. So that the two derivatives of x with respect to t and y with respect to t would have to be constants. Well, if their derivatives are constants for x and y, that means the equations for x and y would have to be linear equations. And when we have a linear equation, we think about its starting point, its y-intercept, so to speak, except we're not really thinking about y-intercepts, right, this time. We're thinking about when t is 0. And the slope, the rate of change. So that if you know that a, a particle is moving in a straight line, you can automatically know that the equations, the parametric equations for the two coordinates are going to be linear equations where the starting x value is your y-intercept, again, quote-unquote, y-intercept for your x equation. And your starting value for y, y sub 0, is going to be your, quote-unquote, y-intercept for that equation. And the slopes of the two derivatives, the values of the two derivatives, are going to be the slopes of those two equations. So a is the derivative of x with respect to t, b is the derivative of y res with respect to t. If those are constant, your, your particle is moving in a straight line. So if we have a line that starts at 2, negative 1 and goes to the point 1, 3, okay, and it's saying it starts at 2, negative 1 when t is 0 and it reaches the point 1, 3 when t is 4, then our starting x, our x sub 0, would be the starting x coordinate. Our starting y would be the y coordinate of the starting point. And then these two points would be our x when t is 4. So x uh, at time 4 would be 1 and y at time 4 
would be 3. So we know that our x equation in terms of t is going to be our starting x value, which is 2, plus whatever our slope is, our rate of change of x, times t. Well, our rate of change for x is the difference between the x's, and since we're doing this in terms of t, over the difference between our t values. So dx dt would be our change in x, which is 1 minus 2, divided by our change in t, which is 4 minus 0. So that's negative 1 fourth. So this would be 2 minus 1 fourth t for our x coordinate. And our y function would be the starting value of y, which is negative 1, plus the rate of change of y with respect to t times t. So our dy dt, which is going to be our slope for this, is going to be the change in y, which is 3 minus negative 1, over the change in t, which is 4 minus 0. So that gives us 3 minus negative 1 is 4, 4 minus 0 is 4, so that gives us a positive 1. So the correct parameterization of this, if you just want to write it a little more clearly and the way we normally think of linear equations, x of t would be negative 1 fourth t plus 2, or 2 minus 1 fourth t. And our y of t would be negative 1 plus t, or t minus 1. And that is the parameterization of the line, well, it's actually a line segment, that starts at 2, negative 1, and moves at a constant rate of speed directly to the point 1, 3 in 4 seconds. The next thing to consider is the speed. So remember, speed is also a rate of change, except we don't really pay attention to the direction. So if an object's moving along a line at a constant speed, then its speed at any mo moment in time is actually a combination of its horizontal speed, which would be dx dt, and its vertical speed, which would be dy, dy dt. So if you think about this, here's our motion along this direction. If we break that down into vertical and horizontal movement, then the speed in the horizontal direction is dx dt, and the speed in the vertical direction is dy dt. So if we want the speed in the direction of its motion, notice we've got a right triangle here. So we simply use the Pythagorean theorem with the rates of change instead of with the lengths of the sides. So the speed in whatever direction the particle is moving, its instantaneous velocity, is the square root of the horizontal speed squared plus the vertical speed squared. It's just the Pythagorean theorem applied to the derivatives. And that's going to give you the instantaneous velocity of the particle in whichever direction it is. So if you're just looking at dx dt, that's its rate of change horizontally. If it's positive, it's going to the right. If it's negative, it's going to the left. If you're just looking at dy dt, that's the rate of change vertically. If it's positive, it's moving up. If it's negative, it's moving down. If you put it in this form, since you're moving not horizontally or vertically, we're going to think of this speed as being positive, because speed really is the absolute value of velocity. So this is a speed in any direction. It's always going to be considered positive. So when we take the square root, we don't have to put plus or minus. OK, so finally, let's take a look at another example that gets a bit more complicated. A particle is moving in the plane with x equal to t cubed minus 3t and y equal to t squared minus 2t. 
Now, clearly, these are not linear equations, so that means this particle is not moving in a straight line. But it says, at what times is the particle stopped? Well, if the particle is not moving, what is its speed horizontally, and what is its speed vertically? I hope that you realize that those two speeds would have to both be zero. So if we want to find where the particle is stopped, we need to find the derivatives of x and y and see when is it zero. And they would both have to be zero in order for the particle to be stopped. Because if one of them isn't zero, then it's moving in that direction. So dx dt would be 3t squared minus 3. And dy dt would be 2t minus 2. And I want to find the zeros of both of these derivatives. Well, let's start with the easy one. This derivative, if you add 2 and divide by 2, is only 0 when t equals 1. That means this is the only time that the particle could be stopped at all, because that's the only time y dy dt is 0. So I don't even necessarily have to find all the solutions to the first one. I just have to see if 1 is a solution of this. Of course, if I do find all the solutions, when I add 3 and then divide by 3 and take the square root, here I would get t equals plus or minus 1. So the particle is not moving horizontally at the time being one second or negative one second. The t particle is not moving vertically only when the time is one second. So at what times is the particle stopped? When t equals one. It may not be seconds, it might be hours or whatever unit of time, but I usually think of these in terms of seconds myself. Now, at what times is the particle moving parallel to the x-axis? Well, if it's moving parallel to the x-axis, it's moving horizontally. And if it's moving horizontally, that means it is not moving vertically. So that would be when dy dt equals 0. And we just figured out that only happens when t equals 1. At what times is the particle moving parallel to the y-axis? Well, that means it would be moving vertically. And if it's moving vertically, that means it is not moving horizontally. So that would be when dx dt equals 0. So that would be when t equals plus or minus 1. Now, when t equals 1, it's not moving at all. So it's actually not moving parallel to the x-axis then because it was stopped. So it is never actually moving just horizontally. Here though, at positive 1, it was not moving horizontally or vertically. So we have to eliminate that positive 1. So it's only when t equals 1, sorry, negative 1, is when it's moving parallel to the y-axis. Now, if we want to find its speed at time t, remember, that's the square root of dx dt squared, which is 3t squared minus 3, the quantity squared, plus dy dt squared, which is 2t minus 2, the quantity squared. So we can multiply this out and see if we can simplify it. If I square 3t squared minus 3, I get 9t to the fourth minus 18t squared plus 9. And if we square 2t minus 2, we get plus 4t squared minus 8t plus 4. So combining like terms, we get the square root of 9t to the fourth minus 18 plus 4 gives us minus 14t squared 
minus 18, sorry, 8t rather, and plus 13. So this would be the speed of the particle at any given time t. Last problem we're going to look at. We've talked about finding the equation of tangent lines to a curve in our normal standard y equals something in terms of x form. So if we want to find the parametric equation, then we need to find the straight line motion through that point with the same velocity as the xy curve is having. So we need to find the point of tangency by plugging the time at which we're looking in here. So x of 1 would be 1 squared minus 2 times 1. So 1 minus 2 is negative 1. And y of 1 is 1 squared plus 2 times 1, which is 1 plus 2, which is 3. So that is our point of tangency. Now we also need this line to have the same speed as it had at the point of tangency. So that means we need to look at dx dt at time 1 and dy dt at time 1. So dx dt would be 2t minus 2. So dx dt, when the time equals 1, is 2 minus 2 is 0. And dy dt would be 2t plus 2. So that means dy dt evaluated when t is 0, sorry, 1, not 0, is 2 plus 2, which is 4. So we need to parameterize a line that is going through the point negative 1, 3. And its horizontal motion is 0. So it's not moving horizontally. And its vertical motion speed is 4. So if it's not moving horizontally and it's only moving vertically, that means it is a vertical line. So the equation of a vertical line is x equals the x-coordinate of the point, negative 1. And that would be the equation of the tangent line. If we try to parameterize this, Remember, since it's moving at a vertical rate of 4, that means as time changes from 0 to 1, then the y value is changing by 4 units. Well, our y value was 3, so it's going from 3 to 7 in that period of time. So this is our starting point, negative 1, 3. Our ending point, our x-coordinate, is not going to change, so that's negative 1. And our y-coordinate is going to be 7. So just the same way we did before, our x-equation is going to be our starting x plus dx dt, which is 0 times t. And our y-coordinate is going to be our starting y-value, which is 3, plus dy dt, which was 4 times t. So this would be the parametric equation of the line tangent to this parametric curve when time equals 1.